taking the time in the, on a Monday morning. I uh, really appreciate you being here. Uh, so the, uh, the, our topic, uh, this is uh, Mishlaf and I hopefully uh, you know, plan on uh, working through this uh, together and together with you. Uh, the goal uh, here is uh, for this to serve as kind of an exercise for us and a kind of collective exercise to take a look at sources uh, a little bit less than usual in a way in which we're just uh, kind of given a sheer and a little bit more to be able to raise certain questions, open discussion, and try to kind of unpack how to think about this in a um, kind of a contemporary kind of way. The idea of sexuality um, is, uh, on the one hand, an enormous important topic in terms of engaging um, our students around this. I think that uh, our, uh, uh, our, uh, educate our own experience going to school, I'm not sure of the degree that to which you know, people here would nod, was that it wasn't really a topic of conversation <laughs> in our yeshiva environment, <laughs> or in our homes, um, and there are lots of uh, halakhic sources around it. And uh, just the idea of being able to engage the sources in around, uh, you know, in a, in a Talmud Torah kind of way is uh, important on its own. And then exactly what to do with those sources is kind of another level. So what, and, and uh, kind of that's point number one. And point number two, by way of introduction, is to say that the idea, the topic is, has, is very large and has many different kind of subcategories. Our focus for our set of uh, sessions is going to be on um, what we're calling the internal, primarily the internal uh, 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 set of rules which have to do with how does a person manage um, and consider what is halacha driving at in terms of one's own internal mindset. We'll get a little bit more into distinguishing between the interpersonal and the internal um, as we go along through this first, uh, first set. So what I'd like to do actually is to just start by reading through the first source on page one um, in order to um, really just to consider it, right? to read it and say what it says and to think about it a little bit. This uh, uh, source comes from the tour. Uh, the tour is uh, written by Rav Yaakov Baal Haturim. He's called the Baal Haturim because uh, he was the one who created the structure that was then subsequently going to be uh, the, for, the format for the Shulchan Aruch. Um, he was the son of uh, one of the uh, great we showed him the Rush. Uh, and he uh, organized, there had been um, a, a number of attempts to codify halacha prior to the tour. Uh, the famous one, uh, the, the riff is one famous one, one that we'll focus on, uh, which was another was the Rambam. The Rambam is kind of the great codifier prior to the Shulchan Aruch. Um, and the Rambam actually divided his, uh, he organized halacha into 14 uh, different books. The tour uh, divided this into four different pillars. Um, and it is important because uh, the Shulchan Aruch subsequently essentially takes the tour and the tour's format and that becomes the basis for the halacha that we have. So the things that we'll find here, which is in tour, Evan Ezer, Simon Chaf Aleph, um, then becomes part of Shulchan Aruch. Um, and uh, we're going to read it and consider what it has to say. So we'll start with the beginning. Sarech Adam Lisrachek Min Anashim Me'od Me'od which means that uh, an Adam, a person, needs to distance himself from women, ma'od ma'od, very, very much. That's the first of Shulchan Aruch. So um, we're going to have to engage this as far, the, the, just watching the, <laughs> the faces around the room. Um, uh, and I think part of what we'd like to do is talk out, actually, how to think about this, because you assume that you read this line, and it is um, kind of jarring. At the same time, it is in the tour, and it's also in the Shulchan Aruch. And so the question is, what's happened in the past is to say, I mean, you just kind of, we do a tradition, what, what, what we've done in the past, but don't really learn the text. We're going to kind of learn the text and have to think about what, what to make of it. Um, we'll go a little further. Asulo likrots biyadav uberagla, meaning, well, I should say, the, 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 the androcentric nature of Shulchan Aruch is also striking here, right? And as the addressee is the, is the man, um, and the next set of rules are also going to be directed towards the man. Um, Asur. Sorry, I'm sorry if you already said this, but about what time is this? Uh, the 1400s. 
So this is a little bit, uh, again, prior to the Shulchan Aruch, but, um, but the basis for it. Um, the, uh, and, and obviously that's going to be one of the points of consideration. I think, I mean, just to kind of state it, to be able to put it on the table, um, um, I think that we are coming at this with an assumption that as, um, as modern Orthodox Jews were committed to halacha and to the Shulchan Aruch, and uh, that's on the orthodox side. On the modern side, it means that we're interested in thinking about it and considering what it says and how to actually uh, manage that. Uh, and I say that, it might be like stating the obvious, but it's actually important to state because what's not an option for us is to say, well, we just don't like the Shulchan Aruch, we're going to do our own thing. We're not, we're not doing that. Some people can and do, but we're not doing that. And we're also not saying, well, whatever it is that we've been doing is what we've been doing, and it's been based on the Shulchan Aruch. So, there's not really much to discuss because we think that there's a lot to discuss. Holding on to both sides of that tension is actually important and I have no assumption that as a group of people, I know that for myself, like shifting my mindset or kind of internalizing and wrestling with these things um, takes, uh, you know, weeks and months and years in terms of just kind of digesting how to think about it and how to develop an approach. So I would ask, you know, for kind of from all of us collectively, uh, you know, it, it's a it's an undertaking to say like you know it's worth like trying to uh, kind of think about it, consider it, and like um, I, I guess create a safe space and give time and space to be able to kind of work through how to think about it. Here are some of the examples. Asur lo likrotz biadav ubiraglav v'lermoz be'inav la'chat min ha'arayot. It's probably likrotz biadav ubiraglav. The Vilna Gon says the, the words are supposed to be a little bit backwards. It's, it means to make a gesture with your hands or uh, legs, or to make some kind of gesture with your eyes to achatmin ha'arayot, to one of the arayot. Now, uh, we're to define what are arayot, what's the definition. One of the three big averot in uh, the Torah are, one is idolatry of Odazara, the second is Shvichud Damim, which is taking a life, and the third is Gilui Arayot. And Arayot means uh, uncovering the nakedness. The idea here is uh, the list of Arayot that are enumerated in the Torah. This is not about premarital sex or having sex specifically in the context of Kedushin. This is about, um, most basically I'll say, um, incest and adultery. There are other uh, elements to talk about, but for now that's going to That'll suffice. So this is actually about interacting with uh, one of those adulterous, um, incestuous kinds of relationships in a way which presumably is about being provocative. That's line number two. Number three, asur lishok ima. One's not allowed to be misachek to play around. O lahakel rosho kenegda to be lightheaded, kenegda in her presence. O lahabipiyofia or to look at her. Beauty. And even to uh, take in the smell of her perfume is also prohibited. It's also prohibited to look at women while they're doing the laundry. The assumption is that the laundry was done by the, at the riverside and on the riverbanks and in the river. And so in order to go into the water, women would have to lift their uh, their dresses some measure in order to be able to uh, do the laundry or w- something of that sort. Uh, six, uh, a man's not permitted to look at the clothing of a woman, if he recognizes her, even in the closet, well, you know, clothing in the hanging. Because that might generate sexual thought about her. Pagab isha bashuk, if somebody comes into contact with a woman, asur la halocha chereha, one's not allowed to walk behind the woman, ala ratz, umisal kalit stadim, ola acharav. You're supposed to either run to be able to walk to the side or to walk in front so you're not walking behind. Lo yav or bepetach isha zona fil brachuk arba amot, richuk arba amot, you're not supposed to walk by. Um, a brothel, within, you know, even to come into some kind of contact. If someone looks even at the small finger of a woman with intent to derive pleasure, 
It's as though you're looking at the most private parts. One's not allowed to listen to the voice of an erba or to see the erva's uh, hair. That is the list. So uh, we are going to come back. Uh, right now, the, the, this is just for kind of general reaction and, and thought or things are going to raise. Not about mm-hmm. kind of going through all the detail because we're going to have to kind of unpack it again. But um, I guess I'll stop here for a second. Thoughts? You know, what was interesting to me is in a lot of cultures, men always walk ahead of the women, and it's sort of seen as a disrespect to the woman that she has to walk behind. And here, this is saying you, the, the man cannot walk behind her, so it's sort of a, a flip on that. Mm-hmm. Or maybe that's right where something like that, part of where that comes from. You know, but, uh, yeah? Um, just by virtue of the use of sort of pronouns of the various ways that women are referred to in this list, I just assumed RIO was referring to women in this particular context. Meaning in general? In general, women? just the woman is by nature of herself an RIO. So in I, this context, I, right? Like anything about her, her pinky, her clothing, so her, I, I, her this, her that, everything could engender some sort of impure reaction of the man. So it's interesting when you were explaining it in terms of an RIO being something outside of her, I just assumed it was just another pronoun for her. I, I think the point is very well taken because one of the things that we're going to see is that um, the, the, all of these lines are taken from the Rambam, but they're reorganized. And the way in which they're reorganized give a certain kind of impression. And I think the impression that you assumed is exactly the impression that the tour is interested in conveying, but different than, I think, what the Rambam actually conveys, which you're going to see in terms of how he sets it up. So I would say hold, hold that point, and I think that that's going to come clear. But that's also interesting, because the other thing I was thinking is that, and I'm curious to see how this lays out the Rambam, only because the Rambam is much more Muslim-influenced, where all of this just sounds way Christian. It's just so it sounds so Europe, you know, Christian orient, like the whole notion of sin and women and all of that just seems very much in here. Okay, I understand yeah. what you mean. I'm curious to see that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, any other just uh, reactions to, to to this list of things? Yeah. Doesn't this speak very well for Jewish men? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's speaking well for any man. Because <laughs> you can't trust, because they, they yeah, were so a, worried about right their... look at the clothes in the closet because they can go astray, and the um, little pinky, and anything can just... Can just the there box. isn't a sense of uh, being able to have self-control here. I think, Alice? Yeah, I think this is a room full of a lot of women, and <laughs> I, I think that this is men thinking, and sometimes maybe it's useful. I mean, some of these ideas in a modern context seem offensive, or to the women hearing them, reading them, they seem offensive, and yet, I'm wondering, and I can't say because I'm approaching this as a woman and approaching it in a more modern context, but I'm wondering if there is some hidden truth in here that if there were a man addressing this, or if this room were full of men, they might be saying, well, there's an element of this that you might not be able to understand that there are truths in this that, though they may seem offensive, recognize reality. I think that the point that you're raising is really important in terms of what I think the challenge is for us, which is to try to say, uh, how do you tease out or can we separate or think about the parts of this that feel like they are coming from a context which are which is harder to connect to and relate to and what parts of this are actually addressing something that's really important for us to be able to think about and consider and I think if I was going to kind of jump to the end I would say that part of what uh, what uh, feels interesting and important to us is that not to not do what the two natural options are, which are either one, I think, and this is, I'm just saying it in the extreme, is to say, well, this is what it says, so this is what it's supposed to look like, or this really feels like it's the middle of the 15th century, so I'm actually not going to really think about this or engage it. And the position that we're going to take, which 
is a hard one to navigate, I think. It takes a little bit of kind of collect groupthink to kind of figure out how to go down that road, is to say, well, what is it addressing that is meaningful? What is it addressing that feels like you have to think about? And, and can we kind of come together in a path that says, oh, I understand what the Jewish, some of the uh, important elements that the Jewish sexual ethics is actually trying to teach. I'm wondering if you have, if we would put words to what you think might be true in this. Like what parts of uh, that do you think? Uh, I, again, I you know I can only approach it from my own context. Um, that perhaps there are elements of um, suggestiveness that are not ever intended to be suggested by one party, and yet the person who's viewing it may feel that it's suggestive. Uh, and I also in, I just want to context too. sorry. I mean, it speaks to sociological context as well. If you are in a society where men and women are highly separated, and almost to extent that maybe by a modern sensibility would be considered unnatural, then yes, any form of interaction, and even a woman's pinky, then becomes an incredibly sexualized moment. I mean, think Could about, be. so I think that there's a sociological construct that can make many of these things true. Um, in, uh, in light of this. Yes, I think that's for sure true. I also would like, in, in, when we're talking about the focus on the, the man and what, how, what men look like uh, in this description, I think it's important at least to hold on to both sides of this thing, because there's a part of me that says that with all the focus on what women should do to defend against Ma male this or that, which is very much the discourse in general today. I think it's important to note that the Shulchan Aruch actually doesn't say that. It's actually about what men are supposed it to do. It doesn't say women should not go to the shuk. Right. right. It doesn't say right. It doesn't say women. Right. It's not. These are not a list of restrictions on women because of men. It's a list of restrictions on men in order to be able to make sure that they are thinking carefully about the ways in which they interact. And I think that's so. Both sides can be taken you know, poorly or can be interpreted in a way in which, oh, I understand actually what it's trying to say. It's important to... You know, while I acknowledge the sociological, I think you also have to acknowledge the physiological, that some of these experience in the world through senses is very real. So that it, I don't think you necessarily have to be isolated to be, if aroused is the right word, by a, a, a bouquet, a, an odor, a smell. Yeah, which which I I, I want to echo that in 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 uh, let's say talking about the the you know the the line number ten talks about asur l'shmoa kol erva. So when we talk about kol isha, the particular manifestation of kol isha today, which is women singing, it's easier to kind of generate this kind this way of thinking about it. That's okay. What, what it doesn't it doesn't say much about men if every time a woman is singing there's the possibility of and then that becomes the conversation but on the other hand there's not a question if you ask any teenager who's ever gone to uh, you know watch the rated r movie or that can you imagine a woman's voice being seductive uh, and does that have an impact does that matter they'll say of course so there are ways there's a certain kind of translation of the laws that I think are really important to consider because on the one hand you say what you can't really smell the perfume of a woman on the other hand you'll say well women wear perfume for a re not always for that reason but actually something a, a scent can make a difference you'll say here is something about a woman's voice and say um, what every time a woman says you know says or sings something that should be sexually provocative and you go in that direction and sometimes when we do that we lose the awareness of the fact that our kids, I'm going to speak, a lot of this is about talking about how to talk to our kids. Our kids are exposed in a, to ridiculous degree, to sexually charged voices, I'll say of the opposite sex. So do I think line number 10, for example, is an important one for us to consider in terms of what a Jewish sexual ethic should be? I would say 100%. I think that it should be a really important line to consider. And Our kids will also say it in the other direction too. We and it goes men's voices. And when I talk, when we talk to kids about it, we say it should operate. But that's if you just take that as an example, that's a tr that's a very significant move. That's like a kind of a translation of a whole of those four words into something that's very different, which is. Uh, you're not allowed to hear, one, one version, you're not allowed to hear, a, a man is not allowed to hear a woman sing or maybe even speak. Two, 
voices can be sexually provocative, the rule is here saying that you got to be reflective about the ways in which you engage with sexually provocative voices, which perhaps in Shulchan Aruch is androcentric regarding the woman, but maybe what it should be saying in an environment which is much more um, interested in mutuality and equality, it should be something which is to be considered by girls regarding boys and by boys regarding girls. We are very far right now from being able to articulate a halachically oriented value of kol isha, which is, I think, really direly needed for our kids, maybe for our adults too, but I'll say certainly for our community of kids. And I think that the reason, one of the reasons which, which makes it difficult to do that is because we are stuck in a different kind of conversation, which is, are we dealing with an old with a halacha that doesn't resonate and trying to create this kind of world again because that's what it said? Or we're saying that's antiquated and so this rule doesn't really apply anymore. And I just want to check whether it's clear the ways in which, just using that one line, number 10, that you can take that and say, with consideration, actually sitting and deliberating around this idea, you can say, oh, I, get, I actually get what it's trying to say. And it can actually be saying something that is really important and meaningful and powerful for this group, this community of people, especially, and it's through its media exposure and all of that. But it, it's not where that, that needs like some kind of movement or to be able to arrive at an understanding of that. Does that, is that, I mean, that's important. I just want to stop for clarifying. Like, does, does that make sense? Okay. Then the question becomes well, how much of this can you do that for? Or does that really work? Well, first I would just ask, how much of this, we always assume that the, the, the how, do you think we keep these halachas? This list of, this list here. I'm actually just who's asking we? you to look. Um, uh, who's uh, we? Who's we is a good question. That's part of the question. <laughs> what I was going to say is who's we, but I'm actually asking you for all of these we's, and, I'm ask, and I also would ask you to zero in on them specifically, meaning what we tend to do is say, do we keep these halachos? And we say, like, some we's do and some we's don't. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually not asking. I'm asking, like, the reason why this is, you know, what we want to put this here with numbers on it is to look at each of them separately. Say, even the, we, even, I don't know, the right-wing community, the modern Orthodox community, the more liberal community, do, which of these do we keep or not? In having a co-ed school, we don't keep to all of them strictly, but we certainly set limits for the kids. And you got to make the distinction between adults and kids. The idea of a father not being able to go and see his daughter in a play bothers me. Of course, any man who's going to be turned on by 12-year-old girls, I worry about him, not the girls. Okay. okay. Understood. But I still, I just want, I, 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 I hear you know? what you're saying. I want to push us to, to get kind of at, start with the text and work the other way around. Meaning, let, let's take number two. You're not allowed to uh, wink or gesture to um, the arayot, th uh, to any of the arayot. I'm, I'm asking, like, just, just to think about that in real social practice. I don't know, do people do or don't do that? In our community, we don't do any, we do, obviously, we, we have a co ed school, right. so kids joke around, they do that all the time. Well, not only that, even if you're going to say that we're in, in, in communities that limit physical interaction between the kids, I think a lot of their interaction falls into this category. And you can even call flirting yeah. mm -hmm. in this category. And adults in every community, even a shidduch kind of community, this is probably the sum total of a certain amount of interaction between um, the opposite sex. Well, well a little bit, Depending that's what I'm that asking. Do you, think that, do you think that I, I, ultimately, the, the question here kind of is, do right? Do you think that the, those who we think keep all the halachas, do they keep all of these halachas? Or do you think you can socially, is it, is it kind of socially possible in the world that we live to actually keep all these halachas the way that they're described? The reason why that's important is because if everybody is, if I, I'm working, well, I think that we're both working on the assumption here that 
even right even right leaning communities there are they might be separate seating at weddings but they certainly socialize with each other and when they don't they work mm -hmm. if they don't socialize with each other then that seems you know the idea of separate lines in supermarket you know there's a certain point where if you actually try to implement these things it really raises not even within the categories of <laughs> the, what we're comfortable with but it becomes like really um, extreme and the reason why it feels to me important to do that is because it's I think that it's fair to say that all communities are actually struggling with it's not as though there's the clear abiding community and the you know the, this kind of modern community it's like everybody these are rules that um, like that end of number three there like you're not allowed to look or geese intentionally at a beautiful woman like that's you know um, if you think I don't about know that about playing you, but I've met people, know people that I grew up with, and they reached a certain age, and I'd walk into their house, and they were down covering their eyes. They would not look up. The only person they looked at, and even that time I questioned if it happened, was their mother. Mm -hmm. No other woman, and they would cross the street, anything, mm -hmm. so they would not have to look at the person. Good. So the, yeah. the Shabbat, two men who looked pretty identically right, right of the fence, walked by me, and one nodded and said, good Shabbos, and the other one crossed the street. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they looked like they were from the same community. Right. right. So, I mean, to, and to be clear, what we are not, what this isn't going to be, right, is to explain, is to explain why it is that it's good that we are more modern, integrated, and co-ed than that. No, kind I'm of just saying it's right? like, right? Yeah, I mean, no, I'm not. Those that are right, and I, I mean, I've been to weddings, and I have cousins who are right of right, and the only people they will speak to are their siblings, their sisters, their wives, their mother, mm -hmm. they have, and their grandmother. They have aunts, they have cousins, the women at a certain age, until it's the parents say, you have to be polite. And I, I think it would be, for us to have a certain sense of integrity engaged in the conversation, I think it's important for us to say, and where does that come from? And the answer is, it comes from the tour and the Shulchan Aruch, mm -hmm. and in trying to keep to that as much as possible, which I think puts a question on us which I think we should be comfortable trying to engage and think about rather than just dismiss. I think that's part of what we are trying to do. It's like, think about, okay, what does that mean? Are we just saying, or are we saying something more than that? And I think the examples from like coalition and stuff and, and, and things like that suggest that there would be something beneficial, purposeful for us as a community actually thinking about, uh, like what Al said, what are the positive values, what are the real values that are trying to be communicated here? What might that look like for us? Because, and this you can take, I mean, we would both say, spending our lives with high school kids exposed to the media, it's necessary. It's, we, we need to do something like that. We need to actually think about that and develop a communal kind of energy around teaching towards these things in a way that is much more directed than it is now, because I think it's a real problem, actually. Yes? Rachel. In the text and also, and also in life. Here that like you can't look at someone, or that the, the you we have social exchanges all the time, and you know your eyes meet someone, and that means something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean a sexual thing, like the room, like a hint of one of the R.I.O. Yeah. Like is the you know I think that there's a distinction here, and I think also as we you know, take it out more broadly, that there's a distinction between. Giving some, you know, looking at someone and giving someone a look. Yes. Yeah. So where we would like to go, and that'll probably be next week, is to start trying to make some of those distinctions and to see whether there's a real halachic argument to be made between those kinds of interactions, you know, those two different kinds of interactions. Um, but we're going to do a little preparatory work first. So yes. Uh, what I'd like to do in the next two sources is to try to um, give a little bit on the assumption that there is a content, there is a uh, backdrop here. Uh, what, what's going on? How do the people, how do the tour and the Rambam actually think about their social worlds? So I'm going to try to read these through into that a little bit more quickly. Um, here's the introduction of the tour to Evan Ezer. So this is his own introduction to um, this particular Chelek and Shulchan Aruch. Um, and he's going to explain why it is it is called Evan Ha'ezer, which is Evan is a stone, Ha'ezer as in the kind of the helping stone, Evan Ezer. Kasher Katava Chacham Rabbi Avram Bar David Besefer Nefesh. He's quoting the Ravid who wrote in his introduction, in his Sefer regarding Tarat Mishpacha. He says, Kila Tova Ta Adam Ulohana Ato Hagdola Asher Zeh. 
Sorry, I gave too much. I think I wanted to cut uh, <laughs> cut that a little bit. Um, no, I'll read the second line. God realized that if he had created male and female like all the creations, um, God, when, it, when, when God says, I'm going to, he goes back to the creation story, and he says, when um, it says, Ul Adam lo ezer kenegdo, he didn't find a partner. So what does that mean that he didn't find a partner? He says that God recognizes that if he just created male and female for human beings, as with animals, the system wouldn't work the way that it is supposed to, because, the way that it, it, in its ideal way, because then male and female human beings would be like male and female animals. What would be wrong with that? If the female would be to the male as it is with animals, that with animals, because uh, um, I, I know that the whole room, we are, we are almost the whole room, going to it, is going to react that way. But that's what I'll translate. It means that the female is not going to accept is not going to accept the um, the dominance, the rule, right? Uh, the, the man is the king of the household, um, and that was going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second, it's it's a a it it oh, I didn't <laughs> say that. Wait a second, I wouldn't be serving him. Yeah, there is no question. Meaning this, what I call this introduction to the tour, we can put that, and it's not. I mean, we we, we can all we should react the w that way, okay, <laughs> and then also recognize that the idea of the, um, I think, uh, you know, Ethan Tucker used the term as having a wife as the wife is the adjunct. I mean, that all households need an, need an adjunct. Somebody who's going to make sure that everything's running so that the person can do whatever the person, you know, can do, which in, uh, in the household would be, so the man can do what the man could do, is supposed to do in the world, the female is going to serve as the adjunct. This is a clear kind of adjunct setup. All this does is, and the way that I think that we should, the, uh, just, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to keep on saying this out loud, I'm just going to keep on saying it out loud. I, we understand that this is like a jarring kind of text, but rather than not pay attention to it, feel like it's important to read it, take it in for what it is, understand how it is that it makes certain sense, and then understand, okay, try to figure out, okay, well, what, what parts of that are different now, and then how does that impact on the rules that we're taking. I'll say again out loud, that can be, okay, how can I accept the Shulchan Aruch if it's rooted in this kind of practice? And I would say, I understand that somebody might, I don't want anybody to say that. I don't think that we should say that. I don't think we need to say that. I think that what we need to do is consider the rules and figure out what is the sexual ethic and then kind of translate that in a way that actually works and makes sense, which I think is actually possible. But I think that part of what happens with not reading these things and considering it is that we just don't, tackle it at all, and we don't tackle it at all, we don't, and we are lacking, I think, in an approach to managing these things for ourselves and for our kids. So yes, the tour is rooted, and that's the point. The point is to say, where's the tour coming from? Clearly the tour is coming from a, set, a setting where the female is an adjunct. Let's go on. Turn late. Um, he's concerned about a lot of swapping going on, because if the woman is not committed to the, if there is this, isn't this kind of subservience, then how's, how is everything going to, how is there going to be stability in the family structure and societal structure? Okay. That's the reason, this is interpretation of the creation story, which is not a bad interpretation. If you think about it, why was human beings created, why was man created as man, and then female taken from the side of the man, created the man alone, and built the woman, created the woman from the part of the man, so that she would be a part of him and subservient <coughs> to him in the way that, or serve him, I actually think is better, I think that's what it means, that in order, in the same way that the limbs of a person serve the person, the wife of the person of the man should serve the man. It's exactly like a limb of the person. And so that you should have that, the man, under his control in the same way that, the, that uh, one of his limbs, etc. 
Um, I will just say, therefore, he explains, I'm going to stop reading the text. You can uh, leave that to you if you want to read more. But he says, that's why this book is called Evan Haezer. Why is the book that talks about marriage and uh, divorce and Puravu and all that called Evan Haezer? Because actually that's what it's about. It's about the rock who is the helpmate of the man. That's what Evan Haezer actually is, was, that's what was meant by Evan Haezer by the tour who generated that term. What's our purpose in introducing this? Just to say, we feel obligated to halacha, which we should be, but we also should recognize the context within which this halacha is being written, and then we have to consider, well, what are we going to do about that? How do we manage that? Because to us, it's not acceptable to say, therefore, it just doesn't apply. Uh, it's also not acceptable to not acknowledge it. So we've got to figure something else out. On page number two, we bring a Rambam, which is a different example of what it means to be living in a different kind of context. The Rambam says, and this is an example of the Islamic um, world. Um, ironically, I mean, while, Christi while the Christian world had a certain view on sex, the Islamic world had a much more restrictive view on the interaction between the sexes. It could be that those two things are related. You can be worry less when you're restricted in other ways. You've got to worry more when you're not so restricted. So um, in Christian Europe, uh, the side of Europe is much more, is relatively more open. The Rambam writes as follows. Because every, every woman needs to go visit her father. You have to go, you know, people have to go to uh, weddings and shiva visits. Um, to uh, do chesed, see your friends, for, your, for your close, those close to you. Um, uh, it's impossible for a woman to be treated as though she's in prison and can't come and go. That would be terrible. There are things that she has to do. It is considered shameful for a woman to just go around the neighborhood, walking around. And the male should prevent, the husband should prevent the woman from doing so. She should be allowed to go out once or twice a month, as is necessary. A woman should be at home. That famous pasuk. I quote the tour and the Rambam in order to show this is a obviously dramatically different world. And then the question is, there's the halacha. First source, there's the halacha. Here are two contextual examples. What are we supposed to do with that? That's kind of end of stage one. And I think that there's what to do with it. OK. You're frustrated? Or no? <laughs> Can you help me out? I just want to know if people are frustrated. Is there no? Is it significant that the tour's introduction only deals with one creation story and not both of them? Um, I mean, that's kind of selective. I mean, I, I mean to the creator, it's just say you can tell a different yeah. story. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's trying to make points so that. Yeah, I think that's a little bit true. I think that's a little bit the, you know, the, I think part of the enterprise here is to say that's a certain struct, there's, there's, there's a uh, certain creation story which creates a certain kind of narrative. If somebody would say, you know, we have a mutual, we have a mutual and equal oriented kind of uh, disposition, we can have a creation story to match, then yeah. The question is though, does that mean, what is that, what, our question is, what would that do in terms of the interactions between the sexes and the Jewish sexual ethic, what would change, and what should still, uh, what, you know, how 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 can we um, kind of implement the ethic in a way, even given that story? I think that's where we want to go. Okay, so we're going to start. Yeah, I'm going to answer your first question, not the one you just posed. I struggle with the fact that each of these great thinkers put these words down or etch them in stone in a specific historical and sociological context so that it's very difficult for me to say that those words are etched in stone. I, I th so I think it echoes your question. So how do I consider them now in light of what I understand about the Islamic world, what I understand about the Christian world? Yeah. Okay. That's the question. That's the question. <laughs> that's and I, very I, well. I, yes. Yeah. And I think let's hold that question because that's what we're trying to set up and then we'll go further. Okay. That being said, I'm going to like ask you to kind of hold it and then we'll start learning texts which are not going to immediately answer but ultimately will. So you've got to take a step back. 
So what does the Torah actually have to say regarding these kinds of prohibitions? And I want to uh, present two sets of psukim, which basically point to two different kinds of issues. The first is the, story, is the issue, the set of arayot, which are written twice, once in Parshat Achimot and once in Parshat Kedoshim, and enumerate a little bit in Torah as well. Um, and I'm going to just read through the psukim to get a little bit of a vibe. And these are, again, the rules, that, the, the prohibitions that are focused on it's not about sex in general, although we tend to think about it that way. This is actually about incest and adultery. Uh, the Pasuk about um, homosexual sex is in here too, and bestiality is in here too. And, and it's important kind of to get the vibe. This is, not, uh, this is again, specifically focused on what we call Isuri Bia, these kinds of prohibited interactions. You should not be like the Egyptians. Um, I would just say that the point of this Pasuk is really saying you're coming from Egypt, you're going to Canaan, you need to be countercultural when it comes to these matters. You can't do what the Egyptians do, and you can't do what the Canaanites do, what you're going to see them doing. I think that there's something very shot, a peep shot very powerful in terms of what this whole thing is driving at, which is you have to have a countercultural sexual ethics. You should do what I tell you to do. If you follow these rules, which in Chumash often means not that you, and here I think means not that you should live, although there's a trash that means live as opposed to die, as the Rambam writes, the word chai is an equivocal term. It can mean live as opposed to die. It can also mean thrive. It means like live. You should follow the rules. These rules so you'll, you'll thrive. I um, quote two examples and then skip to Pasuk Yotet. Ish isha kol she'er b'sara lo legalot yashem. It, relatives are off limits. For example, ervat alicha ervat imcha lo tegalei imcha hi lo tegalei ervata. Parents are uh, considered off limits and that's considered um, incest and that's capital crime. And then it's Lotik Ruvu, like Alot Erva. And which is, um, like yes, I was going to do that for you, Ted. Yes, okay. which is going to, right. And Veli Shabbat, he dat tumata, So that's actually going to be, uh, we're going to highlight the difference in those terms in a second. I want to kind of contrast that with a pasuk, with Psukim in Perk Hav Gimel, which is actually talking about the camp, when the camp, uh, the encampment went out to wage war. And the war, this, the encampment was considered to be a sanctified place, uh, to be pure, um, because the mission was a sanctified mission. So the Torah describes, Ki um, and I'm reading these Psukim by really way of contrast, when you go against your enemy, when you go out to war, nishmarta mikol davar, you should be careful, um, you should protect against any uh, evil things happening. If a person, if a man will become tame mikre laila, which means that he had a nocturnal emission, so he becomes tame. Um, sex by definition creates tuma, even in a, uh, even in a, a marital, legal relationship because of that loss of potential life since there might be the conception of one child but there's loss of lots of sperm that generates tuma um, if it's mikre laila and the basic juxtaposition here that you're trying to set up is that as opposed to the arayot which is interpersonal this is personal this is just a person on his own there's no no one there there's a sem, uh, an act, a seminal admission that person has to leave the encampment at the end of the day then the person can become tower and return to the encampment so the bat and then the next so which i'm not going to read say the bathrooms also have to be outside of the camp which means there is a sanctified camp what does it mean for the camp to be sanctified so Clearly, the bathrooms are outside. You get that. Also, any sexual, a nocturnal emission, seminal emission creates tumor. That has to be outside of the camp. Can I just say something here? Like, it's just fascinating. The way that this is in the context of war is so fascinating because it's all about, like, the, the degree of sanctity. Like, you're fighting, right? What are you going to do in war? You're going to end up killing people, right? And what if we say, like, at the same moment that we're going out to war and saying that you're going to end up killing people, we are saying that you have to have the, the degree of sanctity of life within the camp is really highlighted. So there's a... There's and that, 
Uh, and we and what Chazal did was to take that idea and that intensity, and then expand that idea of Nishmartami called Davara. If that's the definition of sanctity in its most sacred spaces, then that's the definition of sanctity in day-to-day -day life. What we're trying to set up here is two different categories that we're going to see that the Gemara and then subsequently the Ramban actually, uh, the Rambam, sorry, takes very seriously. One being an interpersonal set of expectations and one being an intrapersonal set of expectations. What does purity mean in terms of interaction between the sexes? What does purity mean um, on one's own? Because that also generates impurity when not managed properly. But so the is that sex that is okay in this context. Just not well there are only men in the camp, so there's no sex. Yeah. Sex would not be okay. And that's not because, defi to be clear about that, defilement, you know, they, it's, there's a little bit of a jump that's made because defilement has nothing to do with bad. Defilement, in general, tahara has to do with life, tumma has to do with death. Tumma and death are always uh, associated, which is why a dead body is the highest level of tumma, um, and down to what is... Which is why men menstruating women who are... Menstruating women is generates tumma not because there's something bad about that, but because there's a loss of potential life, which is why the wasting of sperm is also, also generates tumma because that's the loss of uh, potential life. So there is this kind of life affirmation that is manifest by generating tumma whenever that, is, that possibility of life is lost, which means tumma is not bad. Tumma is part of a general kind of statement, which can poke a hole in the argument of Chazal ultimately, but they do it anyway, which is to say, the fact that there's tumma generated there means that there's some kind of expectation that people need to have of themselves, even on their own, in terms of managing their sexual uh, lives. And so those two things are distinct. Setting that up, I'm going to turn. Uh, I can't turn. I do the source at the bottom first. Um, one more thing in order to be able to go to have the Rambam structures all of these things which is the Avot Rabbi Nasa uh, next to the last source on the page. Um, um, as Shlav pointed out, when it comes to Ar um, Arayot, the Torah continuously say, it says, Ervat so-and-so lo tigale, lo tigale, lo tigale. You can't uncover the nakedness of whoever the party is in the Pasuk. Twice, there's a different phrase, which is lo tikrevu legalot erva. So Chazal, who do in close readings of the Pasuk, I find this to be a great read of the Pasuk, of, I mean, I, I get like a Hana'a out of just the kind of the care, the care with which they read the Pasukim. Um, there is a prohibition against uncovering nakedness, which means a sexual act. But then it also says, Lo lo derva, which means you're not allowed to bring close the uncovering of the nakedness. So the rabbi said, what's the difference between uncovering the nakedness and the bringing close of the uncovering of the nakedness? Well, adultery is a capital crime. Um, but before you get to the capital crime, and according to the Rambam, this is an Isr Doraisa, they said there's actually an, a, a, a prohibition against bringing close that possibility. Says the Avos Rabbi Nassan, Ezu siag shasta Torah lidvareha. A siag is like a gate or a fence, a preventative measure. What's an example of... Uh, the Torah itself. We know that the rabbis like to create preventative measures against the violation of the Torah. Every now and then you see the Torah itself establishing a gatekeeper to prevent you from get, go, getting to the greater violation. What is an example of that? The term that says is to say that prior to the sexual act itself, which is the capital crime, there is a prohibition in the Torah of doing something that can lead to the capital crime. Uh, what are the examples? I mean, so I actually, when we do this source with kids, it's always interesting to me to, like, what, what would you say? If you had to make up the rule, what would you say is an issue, uh, a violation of lotikravu, because it could lead to, the, that, to, you know, to that. So, um, you know, there they are three examples. Two of which they get, the third one throws them off. Yochol yechabkena v'yinashkena. You might think that chibuk, hugging, you might think should be permitted. Yinashkena, nishuk, kissing might be permitted because that's not the sexual act. Yidaber imad dvarim b'teilim, or just idle talk. Talmud lomar, lo tikrav. So what is lo tikrav? And this also, I think, is an example of a source that we would benefit from just kind of giving consideration because... When we talk about 
the, he, I'll just throw this out there. The difference in talking about Nagia, the way that our society and our kids talk about Nagia, as opposed to the way in which we can talk about Lutikravu is like dramatically different because Nagia is a ridiculous conversation most of the time. And if you're able to shift the conversation to like, what do you think about like uh, boys and girls fooling around? Like, what do you, just that kind of, and they, they have a, a, you know, intuitive sense about that. Nagia becomes a deflection of what the discussion actually is really about and should be about, which is what should a sexual ethic be for boys and girls if they are kind of interacting with each other? And especially important in an environment where we don't have a setup, which is but we have a co-educational environment. Should we talk about what that is in a real kind of way? And um, I know that, well, uh, I'll, I'll sidetrack myself, okay. <laughs> I actually will only add, I used, to, I used to leave out, I used to not focus on the last example, the last line here, until I uh, learned from uh, our kids that this is totally a thing. Now, you might think that you can sleep in the same bed, clothed, Talmud Lomar, lo tikrav. So I always felt like, uh, who's going to sleep in the same bed, clothed? What's the idea? Until I understand that that is very common thing that, I'm uh, common, it's a common thing that uh, young adults do. They're not ready to have, uh, they're not going to have, uh, you know, the, they're not going to have sex, but they'll sleep over. They'll, they'll do that, clothed. Um, that's a violation of Tikrivu. I think that everyone here would say, the Dvar Betel, the Chibuk Venishuk, I get that. Uh, sleep in the same bed, clothed, I get that. Dvar Betelim, uh, I don't know. Uh, what, what, what do I do with that? That's okay. I mean, it's okay to be in that space because it basically says, I get it. I, I got to think about exactly what one of these things means. But it is kind of setting up this type of th um, kind of uh, gate, uh, gatekeeper in order to make sure. Um, yeah, that. And also, just to say, like, the gatekeeping, I mean, it's very clear what Chazal is trying to do here is say that the Torah, the sensitivity of the Torah here is very specifically around sexual matters. So the gatekeeping is not about Kashrut and the gatekeeping is not about Shabbat because there's something about sexual matters that, that necessitates the gatekeeping in a way that because human proclivities um, are what they are, that's where you need the gatekeeping. It's not about something else. Thanks, which is actually a great segue to, if you can turn to page four for a second, I'm going to go out of order of the thing. The Rambam, I mentioned, and in contrast to the tour, organizes these halachot a little bit differently. And the first thing I want to note is there are two lines in the middle where the Rambam counts the Minyan mitzvot. The Rambam divided his Sefer into 14 uh, books, and, uh, and the organization actually ends up mattering uh, a lot in terms of how this is considered. So, for example, there is one of the 14 Sfarim, just to give you a flavor of how the Rambam works, Sefer Zmanim is one of the one of the fourteen Sfarim, and Zmanim talks about times, which basically includes Hilchos Shabbos, the laws of Pesach, the laws of all the Chagim, etc. That's Zmanim. Nashim includes the rules of Hilchot Ishut, which has to do with marriage, and Hilchot Gerushin, the laws of divorce, and a couple of other categories that we uh, which we need explanation. So I'm going to just kind of leave them aside. These rules are not there. These rules are not in the rules of marriage and divorce. They're actually in a different Sefer, and that is the Sefer of Kedusha. The Sefer of Kedusha. What are the, what are the uh, rules, what are the subcategories that are, if Shabbos and Pesach and Sukkot and Rosh Hashanah are in Zmanim, what's in Kedusha? So there are three things that are in Kedusha. One is the rules of Ma'achalot Asurot, the things you're not allowed to eat. One is, second is the rules of Shechita, and the third is Isurei Bia, the prohibited sexual interactions. And that's where all of this boy-girl interaction and adultery and incest and uh, kind of managing your sexuality is placed. What do you make of that? The Rambam was super deliberate. What? Physical. It's phys very physical. Yes. Why is it called Kedusha? So the Rambam writes, Sefer Chamishi, the fifth book, Echlo Bo Mitzvot Shel Biot Asurot, U Mitzvot Shel Machalot Asurot. I basically going to deal with sex and kosher, sex and food. Actually, when you say it in English, it becomes almost clearer. 
What is it about sex and food? Sex and food define cultures. It's about appetites. And how you manage that is really important. What? Physicality. That's the fit. We're back to physiological. We should be very yeah. proud. What the Raman is basically saying is we know that there are lots of rules around food. Like actually, food is what defines what it means to be Jewish, kosher or not. Eating all, all the food things, what makes it. And what the Raman is saying is sexual things. And, and if you think about it in terms of cultures, food and sex, because they're so basic, and maybe so primitive. Culture is defined by how you manage those things. And so what the Rambam says is, like if you go back to the Psukim, Kemaseir, it's Kana'am, and Kemaseir, it's Mitzrayim. What this is saying is, what does Kedusha actually mean? To separate. Kedusha actually means to separate. What makes Jews Jews? I think this is the Rambam saying no less than this. What makes Jews Jews? What makes us separate from everyone else? How you deal with food and sex. I think that's something that we should be very proud of, not embarrassed of. I think that's like a really big deal, and I don't think that we're able to talk about it in a way yet, in a way in which you say, wow, that's actually really great. And so the Rambam says explicitly, he says, These are the two ways which God sanctified us as a nation and separated us from the other nations. In the way that we deal with matters of sex and the way in which we deal with eating. And that's why it's put there. That you say that only because the first thing that popped into my mind when you start to introduce this one was that food clearly separates us from everybody else, but at least the interpretation of the sexual prohibitions largely just separates us from each other. Okay, so that's fair. Well, in, 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 yeah. in, in like in practical so applications. I, yes, so I think, I, I, I feel like when I read this Rambam after kind of considering it for a while, I get to the kind of a, get to a point where I feel like there's an aspiration here that I think would be very noble. And, and the challenge, if I put all the pieces that we're doing so far, is how do you create a co-ed world which actually takes the ideas of Kedusha seriously and manifest it in this kind of environment. And what kind, And that's like a, a, a large task, but I think is a, is, a, is a wonderful task. And I think that Allah has a lot to say about that. I'm going to try to do one more thing in the last three minutes. I'm going to do it a little bit too quickly, but I think we can make the point. Let's go back to page three. Um, the Rambam uh, is in Hilfot Yisurei Bia Perkaf Aleph. Allah, this, so this is all these rules we've been talking about is at the very end of Yisurei Bia. Um, and the Rambam says as follows. Um, we'll, we'll note that the Rambam comes before the tour, and all the lines in the tour exist in the Rambam, but the order is different. The Rambam says as follows. Kol al erva min ha'arayot derech evarim o shechibek v'nashach derech ta'ava. If somebody has... Um, is, is, has a, um, a, uh, commits a sexual act, but not intercourse. Derech Evarim means a sexual act that is not intercourse, um, Oshe, which, which can be oral sex or something of that, that nature. Oshe Chibek, or hugs and kisses Derech Ta'ava, with uh, passion, V'nehene Bekiru Basar, and derives benefit from that, Tareza Lokim Torah. That is a violation of that you get Marcus portion and Mar Levotia Sot Mehukota Toivot, Benamar Lo Tikru Galoterva. What does Lo Tikru Galoterva mean? Klomar, Lo Tikru Lidvarim Hamavim Lide Gilui Erva. You should not bring close those things that can ultimately result in Gilui Arayot. So the Ram actually starts with a discussion of the Isur Do Raita of what might lead to something greater. Here the Rambam says, and I just will s- note, the context of halacha bet, and we're going to go back to your point very beginning in terms of how the tour structured it. How said davar michukot elu? If you do any of these wrongdoings, are you chashid al arayos? We suspect that you might be um, in a bad way in terms of ma- in terms of arayot in general because you're not managing your sexual drive. V'asur la adam likrotz bi adav o braglav o lirmoz bein nav lachat min haarayot o l'schokima o l'akil rosh l'afil l'ariach b'samim she'aleha o l'abit b'yafia asur. I just read that quickly, but those are lines. Li- those are lines two to uh, five, whatever it is, four in the uh, in the tour. There's one significant difference though here in terms of the tour structure and the Rambam structure. Which it's exact, and, that, and th- here's the tour's maneuver, which is almost like brilliant and 
sly. I don't know exactly how. There's no tzarich adam litrachik min anashim me'od me'od in the Rambam. It's not about men separated from women. It's about what you have to do to make sure that you're not committing the adulterous, the vi- that really wrong sexual act. And actually, if you read the Torah, the Torah quotes it. He even says it's min ha'arayot in line number two. But the introduction of line number one, gives a different feel to the whole thing, which is about separating the sexes. The Rambam is super committed to hierarchies. What did the Torah say? What did the rabbis say? But let's make sure these things are totally clear. And the reason why that's so important is because everything that's interpersonal with, an araya, with the Araya, that's actually what he's talking about uh, here. And that actually makes, they have to define who the Araya, but who you're not allowed to have that kind of interaction with, somebody who's in Ereva, that's a discussion on its own. I think we're going to have to come back to this a little bit. Um, and I guess all I will do for right now is just note that um, if you go all the way to Halacha Yutet, the Rambam Dan in Halacha Yutet shifts from talking about the interpersonal categories of looking at, generating relationship with those kinds of things that actually can and, uh, open up a sexual interaction with another person as opposed to what I, we are talking about as being the second parsha, which is about managing one's own internal drives, which the Rambam calls the prohibition of hirhur. Hirhur means to think about. And so if lotikravu is an issue of bringing close, kind of opening a sexual interaction with another person, hirhur is about managing one's own internal um, kind of sexual drives. And here the Rambam talks about Asula Adam Shi Kasha Atzmola Dat or Yavi Atzmoli De Hirhur. Person's not allowed a man's not allowed to arouse himself. El im Yavolo Hirhur Yasieli Bom Divriavai. If he has this kind of sexual thought, he should try to distract himself. And then in Halacha Khaf and Kafal he talks about the things that can generate that kind of thing. Number in halacha kaf, lo yistakel b'behema chayav ba'ol pishas shemizdakikim zachar l'nekeva. You're not allowed to look at animals when they are engaged in sex. That's uh, in the Gemara. Rambam quotes it. Chafalif, chayin asul adam yistakel b'nashim bishas shenom dot al kvisa. A man's not allowed to watch a woman while she's doing the laundry. I feel yistakel b'gdei tzemer shelishas shumakira to look at a woman's clothing, even when it's hanging in the closet. You're not allowed to walk behind a woman. So all I want to, and with this I want to end, is to distinguish that where the tour actually mixed all these halachot together as part of a spirit of tzarich adam litrachik min anashim me'od me'od, which we get a vibe of basically saying you should create a world in which the men and women are totally separate, and the men don't have any access not only to interactions with other women, but also seeing anything that's happening with other women in order to make sure that that's true, that, that people kind of don't do the wrong thing. The Rambam follows the structure of, that he gets from the Torah in a much more kind of clearly hierarchical way. First, there's adultery. That's a capital crime. Then there are things that might lead to adultery, and that is a whole set of things which uh, limit the interactions between men and women. And then there's a different set of rules which have to do with one's internal managing oneself, which is not to put yourself in a context which is going to generate co- some kind of arousal. This is a kind of a, uh, I don't know, an odd place to just stop it. We're going to stop here and then kind of pick up how to translate some of those categories um, into uh, into halacha going and take forward. a look at where they where the Rambam's getting this from. Yes, Gemara. right. So um, I think next time we'll probably just round off and pick up and then move to the the sugya. Thanks for coming. Thank Thanks you. For Thank you. Us. <laughs> I think you also say that the Rambam's society was.